Hi, everyone. Uh, we have at least half of the registered participants online. If we can um, just hold on for a minute or two, um, we will start. Uh, there won't be any introductions, which is why uh, I've asked you to put your organization or the country you're tuning in from beside your name so that uh, we, we are able to identify where you're from and who you represent. So um, we'll just wait for a few more to join and then we'll, we'll start. But um, thank you for joining us and thank you everyone for being on time. I got that I
Ya la pero no coge. ¿Qué va a hacer? ¿Qué va a hacer? ¿Qué va a hacer? ¿Qué va a hacer? ¿Qué va Mary Burayata, can I ask you to um yes. just put your mic on mute? Just well, thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's lovely to have you all join us. Um, I know some of you are on the other side of the world. And uh, so for you, it's uh, nighttime or early in the morning. Welcome and greetings from the Pacific. Um, this workshop on strengthening oceans reporting is, um, is done in collaboration with the Pacific Island News Association with support from uh, the Weight Institute. And we're happy to have, um, to have you join us this afternoon. Um, I'm based in Fiji. My name is Donna. I'll be facilitating the workshop. Um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to, to uh, 
sessions that will look at um, oceans issues. We'll hear from people who will talk to us about uh, ocean acidification, about oceans management, about conservation issues. But we also will be hearing from um, media in the region who will give us tips on how they have uh, reported on some of these issues, uh, as well as you know, research work that they've looked at, websites that they've looked at to get statistics and information. So three days, three 19-minute sessions over three days of um, lots of discussions and everything on oceans. I know we have people from all over the Pacific joining us, um, and we're very happy to have you all here. We um, Just a couple of housekeeping. If you could please mute, have your mic on mute, mute unless you are speaking or presenting. We will have presentations uh, available from all speakers, un unless otherwise. This meeting is being recorded uh, for future reference so uh, you will be able to access it as well later on and uh, you can share it with your team or with your newsroom and one of the exciting things um, i wish to tell you is that we have uh, stipends available for each and every one that will be joining the three sessions at the end of the workshop we will uh, contact you for your bank details and you'll uh, you'll each be getting a stipend to cover your your wi-fi costs over the three days um, so with that in mind, uh, everything that uh, I meant to say, I'm sure I've said it, and uh, I would like to welcome, um, I see that our first speaker is, is not yet online, so I'm going to welcome our uh, executive uh, director, Mr. James Fan, who, is, um, who has been with EJN for a number of years, um, and he's the executive director of the Internews Earth Journalism Network. We cover um, a global community of over 14,000 reporters that uh, write on all topics related to the environment. So um, James is uh, not only uh, our executive director, he's also a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. So welcome, James. Uh, it's lovely to have you join us today. Thank you, Donna, and what a pleasure it is to be here. Hello, everybody. It's great to be able to join you in the Pacific. Um, uh, we are, um, I, as Donna mentioned, I'm based in Berkeley, California. We're on the edge of the Pacific, uh, far away, but close together with you in spirit. And uh, so it's really uh, a pleasure to be able to be part of this workshop. Um, and thank you very much to Donna and our team at the Earth Journalism Network, including Imelda Abano, and several others who uh, have really worked hard to pull this workshop together. It's always difficult when we're so spread out, and, uh, and but they, I think they've done a great job and we have an exciting event for you. Uh, also want to thank our partners at the Waite Institute, the Waite Foundation, and the Pacific Island News Agency, who've been uh, such great supporters and partners of also helping to bring this workshop together, and you're going to hear more from them as we go on over these, the course of these three days. Uh, I, I will keep my remarks brief. I just want to, first of all, quickly introduce the Earth Journalism Network to you for those who are not familiar with us. Um, we are, uh, first of all, a project of Intranews, which is a nonprofit media development organization. We've been active in the Pacific, working with local media for many years. Um, the 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 mission of the Earth Journalism Network is to improve the quantity and quality of environmental coverage. We are a journalism organization. We're not an advocacy group. We are here to help journalists and the meet local media uh, improve, be, to support their, their coverage of environmental and climate issues. Um, as Donna mentioned, we are a global community now of almost 15,000 journalists read who, who are, are members from countries all over the world. If you are a professional journalist, you're most welcome to join us. It's very easy to register on our website at www.earthjournalism.net. Uh, it's free to register and you'll get news and information about all the opportunities that we do offer to, to journalists to uh, help them cover environment and climate change. Uh, one of those opportunities are story grants. Uh, so um, we are currently offering grants to journalists 
from the Pacific to cover stories about the ocean that they've always wanted to do. Maybe some of you have some good ideas for how to, for stories about the ocean that you've been wanting to report on, but you haven't had the funds, you need maybe you need to travel, maybe you need some other kinds of financial support or technical support, uh, because we also offer mentors to the, our grantees as well. So do check out this opportunity at uh, earthjournalism.net, uh, the opportunity to apply, to apply for story grants to do those stories on the ocean. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that as the workshop progresses. Um, I'll just mention a, cute, a few quick words about the topic for this workshop. Obviously, I, I don't need to tell you to the people and communities of the Pacific. It's really your home. And um, it's such a vital force in terms of uh, supporting uh, local economies, local livelihoods, our health, food security, uh, and just our, just our overall general well-being. It's, it really is, uh, the ocean is our home. And, um, and, and that's why it's so important. And, and you folks play such an important role because we really need journalists to do a good job of covering the ocean. Um, and that's not easy. Let's face it, it's not easy to cover the ocean. It's a very big place. It's hard to know what's happening out at sea. It's even harder to know what's happening under, under the surface of the ocean in the depths. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're here today and over the next, uh, over the next week to do the, this workshop is to see if we can help you to, uh, to find ways to cover such a, a challenging but important topic. Um, and it's something I personally have been, I've been interested in doing for over 30 years now, working as a journalist, both in Asia and in other parts of the world. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Donna now, but just wanna say thank you so much for your interest in this workshop and for all your coverage of the ocean, the environment and climate change. It's, uh, it's really important we all do this. So thanks again. And Donna, over back over to you, please. Thanks, James. Uh, we have Dr. Catherine uh, Menjerink with us today, and she's the executive director from the Wake Institute. Uh, Dr. Catherine has more than 20 years of oceans experience um, under her belt. She has uh, worked in marine science, law and policy, which helps to inform decision making. Um, she leads a team of ocean experts um, in developing and implementing blue prosperity programs. Um, so, uh, you know, welcome, Dr. Catherine. It's lovely to have you. I know it's Sunday, uh, your time. So thank you for giving up a little bit of your time to speak to us this, today. Thank you, Donna, and thank you all for joining. Um, I'm really excited about this workshop and and um, and about the work that you're doing. I think that um, a lot of the times that those of us who are working in science and policy, uh, we're not communicating enough uh, about the important work that's being done. And at the end of the day, um, we care very deeply about uh, decision making that reflects best available science, but also that uh, builds a upon participatory processes. And I think that it we require journalists um, to share stories about the ocean so that people care about the ocean and want to work in that space. Um, as James mentioned, you know that the a lot of there's a lot going on underneath the surface, and a lot of us only experience, you know, the, the beach. Maybe, maybe several meters down, maybe if you're lucky, you know, 30 or 40 meters deep in the ocean. But on average, the ocean is over 4,000 meters deep. And it means that it's an enormous space that's incredibly important. And um, it's really essential for us to talk about it. So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. I want to talk to you a couple of times uh, on the call today. But I, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and talk about the Wade Institute and who we are. Um, I have a few slides, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, here we go. And hopefully you all can see, it's just a picture of the Wade Institute. I, I wanna tell you about who we are. Um, we are also based on the Pacific, well, we're headquartered in San Diego, so in the North Pacific, but quite a bit of our work is focused uh, in the Pacific Island regions. And 
Um, specifically, the work that we do is uh, we focus on blue prosperity programs. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what that is. Uh, it essentially is three pillars of work. We work on marine spatial planning, which is essentially ocean use planning. We work on blue economy strategies, and we work on sustainable fisheries. In addition to that, uh, we have various uh, components of our work that provide support to those pillars of work. So we have policy and legal uh, work that we support. We work on science and um, conduct various expeditions in the water. We have a communications and media group who are the ones from our part of the team who helped conceptualize uh, this program. And then we provide support in the social sciences space. And when I say we, I mean, it's a very broad we. And I'll start by telling you about our, our government partners. So um, the Wade Institute works with several island nations all over the world um, to support the establishment of at least 30% marine protection of ocean waters um, that also focuses on supporting communities and sustainable economies. So in the Pacific, we're currently working in uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, in Samoa, Fiji, and in Tonga. Um, and <clears throat> let me just say that there's, as I said, there's the WE, the Wade Institute, but it's a much bigger group. And um, the Wade Institute and the Wade Foundation are two sister organizations. The Institute is a technical team of experts that works in partnership with governments. The foundation provides funding to these programs that we support and, and we're part of a, a global team or global network, which we call the Blue Prosperity Coalition. And this coalition is really, I think, where we um, develop or have a lot of our institutional or coll our collective strength. And so for those of you who are um, journalists and are looking to engage with uh, people in the ocean science space or people working in policy, um, in advocacy, we have a really strong network um, across a global network really uh, to support the um, work in the realm of science, spatial planning, blue economy and sustainable fisheries. So this just gives you, this is a quick snapshot. I won't walk through this, but just to say our partners are both local partners um, in, for instance, in Tonga, we work in a close association with the Bavao Environmental Protection Association, as well as IUCN Oceania, um, as well as global partners such as um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which is one of our core science partners. Oh, sorry. Um, with that, I'll stop there and turn it back over to you, Donna. Thank you. Um, our next session, we're going to go right into it because uh, time does really get away with us when we're when we're in these um, workshops and especially when we're online. Um, so we're gonna go into our next session, which is on understanding ocean management, balancing the economy and the environment. And we have three speakers for this, uh, this uh, session. We have two from the Wade Institute, um, Dr. Angus Friday, who will be talking to us about the blue economy. Um, we'll also hear about marine protection from Dr. Catherine as well, also from the, uh, Wait Institute, sorry. And then we have um, Marisini Potoka, who is representing uh, the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner, which is based at the Farm Secretariat in Fiji. Uh, but first, I'd like to um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Angus Friday, who's with the Wait Institute. Uh, Dr. Angus' uh, work is uh, helping nations design sustainable blue economies to support long-term ocean and community health and well-being. Uh, he is a medical doctor by profession, but he's, um, he's an accomplished blue economy leader and practitioner. He's been with the World Bank as their ocean representative um, and a number of international uh, organizations. Um, so welcome, uh, Dr. Friday, Lo lovely to have you with us. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction, Donna. And I'll share my screen to uh, to, to get us started. And my, my thanks also to uh, uh, Catherine for that uh, introduction. So what I'd like to do is just very quickly give you a sense of the blue economy, why it's important, and 
uh, a few examples of you know some powerful stories um, that that uh, colleagues may want to think about from uh, a journalism and journalistic uh, perspective. So uh, I, I think the first thing to start with is that um, you know when we look at the planet, particularly over the Pacific Ocean, we look at it from space. It becomes very clear that we actually live on a blue planet. And when you look at the Pacific Ocean uh, in that manner, it really gives you a sense of the vastness of the resource that uh, you know is is at hand, particularly for uh, for for the Pacific. Now, the ocean economy is being talked about quite a lot, and here's some work um, that was done by WWF, BCG, and others, um, basically putting an asset value of the oceans of 24 trillion dollars generating 2.5 trillion dollars per year. Now what's important about this is that 70%, 70% of that annual value is absolutely dependent on having a healthy ocean. But we recognize uh, that there are you know, a, a number of challenges with that and there are opportunities. So the blue economy is being talked about quite a lot as um, a great way of balancing uh, the needs of the ocean and the needs of, uh, of humanity. So the blue economy, according to the World Bank, is a sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ecosystem health. But as I, as I alluded to earlier on, there are a number of challenges uh, to that. So climate change is something that uh, all of the Pacific Islands uh, uh, having to deal with, and this is having impacts on the oceans as well. Uh, but also um, IUU fishing, which is uh, um, illegal, um, Ill illegal um, uh, 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 fishing. Um, there are a number of challenges uh, with this, overfishing, subsidies, land-based pollutions and of this. And uh, we see that the Pacific Islands are actually well positioned to do something about this. Um, and I apologize for the, uh, for the noises out there. The Pacific Islands own a very large portion of, uh, you know, of the ocean. Um, and therefore are well positioned to play a leading role. So just look at some of the, the size of the exclusive economic zones of uh, various islands. We see Kiribati at 3.4 uh, million square kilometers, Federated States of Micronesia, 2.9 million square kilometers, and so it goes. I think what's important about this is not just the absolute value but when you look at that value compared to the actual land mass, so for example, for Kiribati, um, you know, seen right at the top, um, its exclusive economic zone is over 4,000 times larger than its land mass. For Marshall Islands, almost 11,000 times larger. For Tuvalu, um, almost 29,000 times larger than the land mass. So, uh, you know, clearly all those small island states really great ocean nations. Um, and as you can see from this map with um, all the exclusive economic zones, um, uh, you know, the Pacific Islands have an enormous role to play and have been playing an enormous role, um, and particularly on the international stage. So let's just look at some of the powerful stories uh, that can have been generated and, and, and that might um, help give some ideas. So here's an article from uh, 2019 talking about how small island states are harnessing the asset value um, of the ocean. So it refers to the large size in this particular article of, uh, of Tuvalu's um, uh, compared to land mass compared to the EEZ. But I think the, the clear message here is that island states in particular have a very large um, asset value that they have control over um, and have a, a critical role to play. Here's another article talking about how the um, Pacific Islands can actually harness indigenous knowledge 
um, and we know that the indigenous knowledge is a very important resource for management of the oceans um, and they, you know, and uh, in the Pacific Islands, uh, there is an enormous um, amount of that resource that can actually be harnessed to support modern uh, stewardship uh, of marine resources. Uh, Solomon Islands and protecting um, protecting the ocean, having marine protected areas, and how that actually links up with uh, livelihoods and, and the importance of uh, um, uh, safeguarding uh, livelihoods. And then we have some other examples that we can quickly um, allude to. In Belize, for example, uh, you know, um, very large uh, uh, reef, barrier reef um, in, in the Caribbean, and the work that they're doing actually to protect marine biodiversity. And in the Indian Ocean, uh, the, the role of Seychelles actually in, um, in driving innovation around oceans and actually delinking growth, delinking economic growth from environmental degradations. So um, I think with that, we just wanted to give you a very quick overview of the blue economy, some of the powerful stories that can be generated from it. Um, this is the start of a conversation, and uh, we just want to let you know that uh, you can reach out to us anytime. My uh, email address can be seen here, a Friday at wheatinstitute.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Friday. Uh, if we can move to uh, Dr. Catherine, who will be um, talking to us about uh, marine protection. Hello again. Um, well, thank you, Angus, and, um, and thank you all again. Uh, so what I wanted to do is, is talk to you a little bit about ocean protection and um, the, the processes and sort of the current state of thinking globally on, on what the needs are as it relates to ocean protection and what are the approaches that, that we think are the best ones to take to achieve those protected area goals, but also recognizing the crucial importance to support the livelihoods of those communities that depend upon the ocean, uh, as well as supporting vibrant blue economies. So I will share my screen again. Um, right. So how do we balance ocean health and human well-being? And really, when we think about blue economy, we are also thinking about um, how to su provide support to those uh, communities who depend upon the ocean. So the challenge that we face today um, that I think many, if not all of us know, is that uh, in many instances, the ocean has been degraded uh, through essentially overuse, over exploitation and damage to the ocean ecosystem. So this includes um, over exploitation of marine resources, pollution, um, conflict where you have um, increased degradation because you don't have a cohesive system of management. And one of the things that we also know is that it's the vulnerable, vulnerable groups in a population uh, that often have the most, that are most negatively affected by uh, a degraded ocean system. And so how do we then shift from this um, overutilized uh, damage system to something that is more vibrant and I would say that the upshot here is that in, in many, if not most instances, um, ocean ecosystems can recover. In most instances, we haven't completely removed uh, the species in the system, even though they're, they may be depleted. And so what, what we're looking towards is how do you design a well-planned ocean that can both protect the environment, but also grow economies that can improve livelihoods, reduce conflict among different users of the ocean, um, establish regulatory certainty, and ultimately enable uh, sustainable development of ocean ecosystems. Um, and, and I'll just say as an aside, and one really important piece of the puzzle here is, is the role of marine protection. So uh, we both need to utilize the ocean uh, because we depend upon it, 
Um, there are many communities, of course, in, in many of the Pacific islands that are deeply dependent on the ocean for transportation, for food, for enjoyment, um, for recreation. Um, but at the same time, when we are using it, we also need to protect it. So marine protected areas or MPAs are places in the ocean where human activities are limited um, to protect ocean ecosystems and wildlife. And when we say that, we also um, it's, it's also true that in many instances that marine protected areas are not only beneficial for the species living inside of those marine protected areas, but it creates spillover effects so that um, fish, for instance, that uh, may be fished by uh, communities or, or even distant water fleets are benefiting from marine protected areas because you have increased populations within a reserve that then spill over outside. Um, there's a growing effort to encourage global protection of at least 30% of the ocean and, um, and to strongly protect at least 30% of the ocean. So often you'll hear uh, 30 by 30 as the catchphrase. And what that means is protecting the ocean, 30% of the ocean, at least by 2030. Um, MPAs are crucial. Um, and the reason that we have this 30% goal is because MPAs are crucial for maximizing climate resilience, for achieving food security and also safeguarding biodiversity. So we often think about it as essentially a bank account and you want to keep enough principal in that bank account so that you can continue to live off the interest um, now but also well into the future. So how do we how do we achieve marine protected areas but also achieve the blue economy that Angus is talking about and the approach that we think is the, the best way to achieve it is marine spatial planning. Uh, marine spatial planning is a process, it's a tool to uh, plan for the ocean. It's, it's a, an approach that's being taken by well over 60 countries, probably quite a bit more than that now globally. And the idea behind it is very similar to land use planning. It's that you're looking to create an area-based plan for how to use, utilize the ocean in the future. And if you look at this um, diagram or schematic, essentially the areas in blue are, are marine protected areas, but then there's all sorts of areas that people are using for different purposes. So some areas may be really important for fishing activities, other for aquaculture, some for wind power, other types of renewable resources. So. Um, as we look to the future, we're looking to develop comprehensive systems of managing the ocean. And we think about five, that there's five key principles that are really core to a marine spatial planning process. Um, one is using best available science. Uh, that includes the existing science that's out there and may include uh, um, developing or conducting research to develop new science. It's a participatory process. So the ocean is utilized by a lot of different stakeholders and all of us globally have um, a role to play in managing it and certainly are completely dependent upon it for our survival. Uh, so we believe that it, it needs a participatory process that involves communities and stakeholders. Um, it's cross sector in terms of planning. So many different ministries are often involved in managing ocean resources. So the concept of this planning approach is to help uh, develop interministerial processes that allow for a comprehensive planning process. And ultimately what we wanna do is utilize this process to balance economic and environmental needs. Um, I'll just highlight one of my favorite examples and um, is the Tonga Marine Spatial Planning Process. It's a process that we've been supporting since 2017, but those of you from Tonga may be uh, more familiar with the, the process that it's been going on for a few years longer than that. Um, so it's a multi-year approach. It is a government-led process. There's a group called the Ocean Seven, which make up uh, seven different ministries, ministries and government organizations uh, that are driving and leading the process with technical support from IUCN Oceania, from the Vavao Environmental Protection Association and from the Wade Institute. The, one of the core features of the Tonga Marine Spatial Planning process is that um, the, the team, uh, the government team from Tonga 
uh, consulted ocean stakeholders and communities twice, and it was all communities. So they took the time and effort needed to um, learn from every community about how they're utilizing the ocean, how they value it, and how they want to utilize it in the future. Um, it was in 2019. Yes, 2019, uh, that the final plan was adopted by cabinet, which uh, protects 30% of uh, Tonga's ocean waters. But we're, they're still, the government's still in the process of passing marine spatial planning law that will codify this plan and lead to its implementation. Um, unfortunately, I can't share with you the actual plan itself because it's, um, I don't yet have permission to do that, but um, it's pretty incredible. And it was really a process that included um, not only government and key stakeholders, but also many communities um, in, in Tonga were involved in, in the process. Um, this is an example that I can show you, which is Barbuda in the Caribbean, where, which was a place where we supported marine or the marine spatial planning process. And this is what the final plan looks like. Um, here and there were the blue zones are areas of marine protection they protected 33 percent of their waters the areas in red are cor coral reef areas and they created no net zones in the coral reef to prevent damage from nets um, to the coral reefs they also created um, these areas in green which are anchor zones so there's quite a bit of yacht tourism that comes to the area um, and they pr they protected uh, representative habitat. So I highlight marine spatial planning because it's it's a crucial tool that uh, a lot of people in the ocean management space are using um, to design plans that are forward looking and visions for the future that both achieve uh, blue economy objectives, but also marine protection objectives. And I'll just leave you with questions to consider. And one of the things that we think about is, is how do we best engage communities in ocean protection? So as you're thinking about ocean stories, um, I think that you know, we're looking to and we're thinking about how do we really encourage communities to be a part of um, the decision making and the processes involved in the ocean and, and to, to think beyond the, the shoreline and, and recognize that the ocean belongs to all of us. Um, another thing is, I think it's easy to call out the challenges, uh, but we want to look to what are the success stories in ocean management, conservation, or community engagement in the ocean, and then how can ocean storytelling help people feel like they have a voice in decision making. Um, ultimately, it, I think it's the communities and the voice of communities that are going to drive politicians to make the decisions to lead to a sustainable uh, ocean. And with that, I will stop there. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you all. Um, thanks for that. So we have one more panelist. We have Marisene Maral Totoka, who is the communications officer with the uh, with OPOC, the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner. Um, Marisene is a journalist by profession. She she studied in um, in India. She's um, written everything from from public information to um, you know, to women's rights and, and the environmental issues. Uh, but now her focus is, is on, on the ocean, of course. So Marisene is gonna uh, talk to us a little bit about the work that they do at OPOC, um, you know, give us an overview of um, what are the key issues that they're looking to um, in the Pacific and with the BBNJ conference uh, that just ended uh, in New York last week, it's, it's um, it's great to have her with us to talk about um, their, you know, their take on that and how they've supported uh, Pacific Island states and, and that. Um, Hi, Donna. Hi. Hello. Marisene, we can hear you, yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear myself. The internet just kind of dropped on my end. <clears throat> I'm uh, Marisene Maraudona from uh, the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner. Thank you for this opportunity to share our ocean story that I've helped uh, drafting since we joined this office in 2018. So uh, at the outset, I just wanna briefly talk about our office. Uh, the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner is uh, 
based here at the Pacific Islands Forum in Suva. And uh, we were established by the Pacific Islands uh, Forum leaders back in 2010 when they adopted the framework for Pacific Ocean Scape. And uh, OPOC is uh, compromise, um, comprises of our boss, the Pacific Ocean Commissioner, who is the Secretary General of uh, the Pacific Islands Forum. And uh, we have a group of uh, support staff that support him in our, specifically in that role. So uh, our uh, of the, the Pacific Ocean Commissioner, as you all know, he is the Regional Ocean Advocacy Spokesman in, uh, at the moment, he's, uh, her, the Pacific Ocean Commissioner is Henry Puna. So the role of our office is uh, to um, provide effective coordination and advocacy for the Blue Pacific Ocean. And uh, that uh, yeah, coordination in, is um, coordination on the imp implementation of the Pacific Ocean priorities, the decisions on ocean and the processes. That's at national, regional, and uh, international level. Let me try and uh, share this slide. I don't have a fancy slide uh, like uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, the, the Wade Foundation, but um, this is um, why our office exists is um, because ocean is uh, important to all of us. As you know, it's uh, our livelihoods, our life, especially for us here in the region that is so proud of our ocean and its uh, many resources. We believe uh, that um, the region alone is uh, 90, you know, the figures vary, but a lot of people say it's 96% ocean. And uh, as a, uh, our friend from Wait had mentioned um, that it's a, for them it's a bank account. We see it as a, in a, our endowment fund. So for this alone, we have uh, heaps of stories that we can uh, you know write on in terms of addressing oceans from um, our heritage, our home, uh, the traditional knowledge that we have. And I thank them for raising the, the dollar value on the ocean. And that's something that uh, we always talk about, you know, uh, like when you're talking about ocean, put a dollar figure to it. And uh, I thank them for bringing that up. But uh, that is uh, basically why this ocean is important to us. For the Pacific people, the ocean provides, you know, food security, livelihoods, our culture, our, and uh, we use it for transportation, uh, and uh, there's a lot of services. We, we term that as services from uh, where we are sitting. So we see all the things that the ocean uh, you know, is providing. And uh, so basically in terms of developing, trying to strengthen these ocean stories, we, uh, you know, we believe that you can basically write about anything from why the ocean matters and how it, how you as our friends from the media can help us protect the ocean, which we see as our endowment fund. So in terms of uh, that's how uh, in the region where we call the ocean, you know, coming from the blue Pacific region, this is uh, the framework or regional mechanisms that governs the ocean here in, uh, in the region. So the, as I've mentioned before, that was how our office was established. We're a small office, we, and we are not the office team of the Pacific Islands Forum. We are kind of a standalone office. And this is what we do in a nutshell. We, you know, try and support our, the commissioner in terms of advocacy, especially when he goes on international level, trying to uh, talk about that uh, ocean issues and uh, why the ocean is important to us here from the region. And one of the issues that uh, we uh, based, um, you know, we're supporting when we're trying to promote and we try, uh, you know, with your support, we would like you to help us, you know, uh, try and get this, um, there's this particular instrument that is being um, 
that is being negotiated at the UN uh, right now. It just concluded uh, two weeks ago, and we thank uh, our media partners, uh, our colleagues from the media who help us cover that story. It is uh, the negotiations on uh, bio, uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, uh, like how they mentioned that the ocean is uh, very deep. The ocean too is very wide. So uh, for us, uh, if I have to share this story on how we, you know, to understand uh, BBNJ as they call it, it's um, like for every country from your shoreline, 200 meters, uh, 200 nautical miles is your economic ex ex exclusive zone. So our friends are telling us all those things that we could get from our EEZ. But anything beyond the EEZ, the, which covers the high seas and the area, that is your areas beyond national jurisdiction. For now, that is free for all. That is why you see a lot of people come, you know, you see a lot of people, uh, fishing boats are there, you know, interested. So this particular treaty is um, the treaty that's going to govern this area. And they've con um, the one uh, aspect, like the fifth round, there'll be a fifth round of negotiations in August. The fourth one just concluded. So in August, we will know the outcome of that particular treaty. But from our office, what we do is we um, help our negotiators in uh, New York who go and uh, negotiate on this treaty. And um, what happens is we converge a group of experts because in our office, we don't have scientists. We don't have people who go out in the ocean. We are more like policy. So we coordinate all these experts on ocean to provide that particular support when the negotiations is going on. So we also help in support of, um, you know, uh, ocean finance work and that some of those were shared uh, in the previous, uh, uh, previous uh, presentation. So this is how we, um, you know, the, a, a particular a grouping that we have, we coordinate, uh, our boss coordinates the Pacific Ocean Alliance. So the, the framework for Pacific Ocean is, uh, Oceanscape uh, spells out the Pacific Ocean uh, Commissioner, and then he coordinates all these people who are part of, you know, who has an interest in the ocean from the private sector, civil society, our partners, uh, the, crop agencies, we have international organizations. So they come under the Pacific Ocean Alliance and uh, we have a meeting that's coming up. Where we, they will talk about ocean issues in May. This is also, will also be the preparation towards our ocean conference in uh, Lisbon in end of June, from June 27 to July 1st. That is one of the big ocean uh, meeting that we are preparing to go to. But before we go to Lisbon, we also have the upcoming um, ocean uh, event next month. And I know our friends from uh, Palau, they are looking forward to that. The, our ocean conference will be held in Palau. So that is uh, one of uh, the biggest um, ocean events that we are preparing for. So. Our ocean in Palau is uh, an international ocean meeting, getting all the international uh, ocean actors who hasn't converged after for, for a few years because of due to COVID. So for us at, in uh, the ocean um, circle, this is a very important year for the ocean because of these big ocean meetings. We have uh, Palau and then we have the our ocean um, UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon in June. So though if, uh, you know, if I was in uh, sitting in your seat, I'll start talking and uh, looking at this story angles on what's the upcoming ocean uh, event, what is our country going to be, you know, raising in those big ocean events, uh, highlighting what ocean, uh, amplifying the messages from there, or who all will be participating for those who always want to, you know, highlight who all will be uh, participating in those ocean events. Those are, 
the things that I will be looking out for. And uh, for story ideas from um, my end, because these are basically the issues that we work on, that we help in coordinate. Uh, one is uh, that is our BBNJ. What is BBNJ? Uh, the, I've shared the analogy of it being no man's land at the moment. And, uh, you know, there, there'll be um, an issue, a treaty, a legal binding treaty by countries, uh, hopefully by August, if they uh, if they've agreed on what the instrument will, will look like. And um, the next one that, uh, you know, that I would really highlight from, and I know that uh, my two uh, colleagues have uh, alluded to is um, your communities, you know, uh, all these big ocean events, all these regional policies, how does that translate to the people in your communities, how it helps put food on the table or how will it affect we as part of the community or like in terms of say for example, marine pollution for if there's a shipwreck out there, how will it affect the, the nearby villages? But that's, you know, the, those are story ideas. If, you know, we have to develop uh, while we look at the, the dollar value, we also must never forget the traditional knowledge, the holders of traditional knowledge in, in our communities. We can always uh, highlight those stories because those stories need to be told. And, you know, you don't want people to come and find out later about those stories, about those people and steal their ideas and go and, you know, work on a concept that these very people should be acknowledged for, that particular knowledge should be attributed to them. So that is the kind of stories to, apart from highlighting the, the, the dollar, the, uh, the Econ economic side of things, it'll be good to always go back, find out from your communities. Your communities will have, you know, fishing um, practices that are just unique to them. They will have knowledge on why this particular fish is seen in this particular time of the year, or why is only the dugongs found in Palau, Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu, or why the humpback Wales of Tonga is decreasing in this particular time, you know. So all of these kind of story ideas is, will be also good to, to write or to develop, especially now when um, a lot of people are, you know, are aware of the tools that's, have, that's around them. So they can, um, you know, citizen journalists can beat you to just highlighting. I'm not saying it's not, it's bad, but they can, always talk about something in their own community. So it'll be best if you, we see those kind of stories coming through uh, your, your newsrooms. And it will also help us as communication officers from wherever we're sitting to reach out to you. And we can also work together to highlight those issues. So the ocean champions in your communities. Please do highlight them when you are working on your ocean stories, because it will really help us to, if we are looking for, for people we can support or people we can take to the international community, speaking on that particular international platform. So for me, basically, the takeaways from uh, this, if there's um, uh, something that I would like to remind you, our friends from the media, please develop those ideas. There is no idea that's too small and don't hesitate to ask. You just might cover a big ocean story that will create a conversation in the whole wide world. And remember that, you know, it will always, it's always good to develop that story idea and we are here. We're here to help you um, get you the ocean expert that can 
help you develop that ocean story further. And um, the, my final point is, we need more ocean stories in the region. Just keep writing those stories. We are from an ocean region, so we need all those big ocean stories in the media. We will help you share it and just keep writing those stories as you know. And uh, I leave you with uh, this quote by Peli Haofa that no people on earth are more suited to be guardians of the world's largest ocean than those for whom it's been home for a generation. And I think for us, the new narrative for ocean is, the ocean is so central to our future. It is uh, too important to neglect and uh, in um, creating a new solution space for the ocean, we can also address broader global uh, problems. And in healing the ocean, we can heal ourselves. The ocean sustains us and feeds us. It uh, connects us. It is our past and our future. And the ocean is not too big to fail, nor is it too big to fix. It is too big to ignore. So you have an ocean of ideas out there that you can always develop. And uh, this is, uh, uh, we've uh, just developed uh, a book on uh, for children. It is known as Our Sea of Islands, Our Blue Pacific. The messaging is very simple, uh, targeting children of, um, you know, preschooling age, uh, age on, uh, you know, trying to tell them on just how important the ocean is. If you want, we can, it's there available on our website. Please feel free to go through it. These ocean books are coming to um, your schools and uh, your countries. We are shipping them uh, very soon. So if you have the time, please feel free to write those stories on our ocean book coming to your side of um, the Blue Pacific. And we are also on the digital space. Our website is there, opocbluepacific.org. And you can follow us on our Facebook on Pacific Ocean Commissioner. We are also on Twitter and we have a YouTube. Uh, we try and upload whatever videos we can on what I think we've lost Mary Saini there. Mary Saini, are you still online with us? Can you hear us? Sorry, where did you lose me? <laughs> Just the, the end of your presentation. Donna, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now we can we can hear and see you. Uh, I think it was your last you are on slide. Mute. I think it was your last slide um, where you were talking about. Sorry, Donna, the... I can't hear you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I think she might be having problems. Um, let me just message her. I, I can hear, I think it's me. No, I can hear you, Marisini and Donna. Marisani, we can hear you. We can see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'll try and share my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marisani uh, and Catherine and Angus. We've had uh, 
very, very interesting uh, panel discussion looking at the blue economy, what it is, some of the challenges in the Pacific, including IUU fishing um, and climate change. We've uh, looked at marine protection, had a little bit of discussion on marine protected areas um, and the work that the Waite Institute is doing in that space. We've also looked at um, some of the issues or the stories being reminded by Mar Marisene about um, the work that they do at OPOC, uh, as well as you know the need to keep writing stories because we are from one of the biggest oceans. We are from one of the biggest oceans. We are um, large ocean states, as uh, uh, Angus reminded us as well. We have a few minutes for Q&A while we wait for our next speakers who will talk about challenges. Uh, but before we go into that, um, a little bit of Q&A. If you have any questions, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, also, if you can identify yourself from where you are calling from or where you are tuning in from so that the speakers uh, know who they're talking to. Um, and yeah, so do we have any from the floor? Oh, we have Mary. Uh, Mary Tuibuniwai. She uh, is asking if there, that there have been numerous reports and publications on ocean and ocean finance. Uh, finance. Um, Mary, can I just say that Mary has been with the um, Pacific Regional Oceanscape Program, which is under the Farm Fisheries Agency. Um, she is now doing work for ADB and the World Bank. Uh, so Mary uh, knows a bit about the oceans and climate finance. Uh, she's asking, how can these reports be socialized with policymakers, particularly for the Pacific, where the blue economy is a new area or sector? So, uh, so as to assist them in implementing or de developing policies around these areas. Um, if any of the panelists would like to answer that, I'm looking at um, Catherine, perhaps, to start off the the answer to that question from from Mary Tuibuniwai. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think that it's it is one of the questions that's being asked by by policymakers so i think that there's a lot of um interest in the world of sustainable ocean finance and um in my experience when, when we talk about marine spatial planning and we talk about marine protection and and long-term ocean health and, and these kinds of processes and programs uh the key questions that we get from government officials are often about, you know, how do we pay for it? So I think that there's a, a strong interest in understanding what the opportunities are in that space. Um, and they're also trying to understand, you know, what is the, the value of the ocean economy um, and how to, how to build upon that. So I, I do think that there's, um, I guess, I think there's great opportunity to socialize them with government if it hasn't been done so already. Um, I think that, yeah, I think there's there's quite a bit of receptivity to it. And I don't know, Angus, you probably have some additional thoughts there. Um, no, I, I think I think some you, you you've made some of the key points, um, Catherine. But just just to quickly add that. Um, you know, regions and regional banks in particular have been very keen to um, get policymakers thinking more and more about the different types of, um, of blue finance. So um, in the, um, at the Asian Development Bank, there's a sort of blue sea um, hub um, that looks at different forms of, of financing um, at the World Bank. Um, there's a sort of pro blue project, and uh, and certainly working at the regional level, the um, you know the banks try to work with governments to um, to get them to implement blue policies in order to uh, uh, you know to, to release capital from the banks. Just to give a very quick example, um, um, one of the countries that I'm familiar with, um, they launched something called the first. Um, fiscal resilience and blue growth development policy credit, wherein that particular country um, implemented a number of blue policies. And as, as a result of that, they could get uh, budget support to the tune of uh, $30 million. 
So that tends to um, um, that that tends to uh, um, you know wake up the interests of of finance uh, of fi finance ministers, and um, you know elsewhere you know in the Caribbean Development Bank has has done something similar. So um, how do we socialize it? Um, well, I, I think uh, you know sometimes you need to have. Uh, regional, you know, re regional initiatives, you know, focusing specifically on, on uh, you know, on some of these things and to try to get people to a decision forcing event that that usually helps. So these are just some uh, initial ideas on that subject. Um, Marisani, did you want to add to that? I know Marisani has been having problems. So um, do we have any questions in the meantime? Any other questions from the floor? Uh, we have something from Belinda Fraser, who is uh, freelancing in Tonga. She's asking from the speaker's experience, what seems to be the general consensus in terms of the Pacific Island nation's approach to seabed mining? I'll start. I probably don't have the answer here, but I'll I'll provide some input. I think that there's uh, there's probably not a consistent um, consistent approach among the nations considering seabed mining, um, with with uh, some nations calling for a moratorium, um, others looking towards exploration and potential exploitation. Um, I think that there has been um, most of the work to date, if not all of it, has been in this space of exploration uh, to try to understand what's possible both uh, within and outside of, of national jurisdictions. Um, but as yet to date, there's not uh, exploitation uh, happening in, in deep seabed mining. And, um, but there is, there's some nations that have a strong interest in trying to develop that. I, I would say that um, while um, something like seabed mining is, is part of an ocean economy, that it's not part of an, a blue economy in the sense that it's, you know, ultimately an unsustainable activity. It's not renewable um, and it's extractive. There's a lot that we don't know about the impacts of, of seabed mining um, both in the context of how it will affect the seabed, but also um, how it will affect the water column as um, you know, as the uh, minerals are pulled up from the, the bottom of the ocean and then some of that um, material collected is discharged back into the ocean. Okay, um, thanks. Catherine and Belinda, do we have any other questions from the floor? If not, um, I'm going to ask everybody to turn on their cameras, please, because we would like to take a group shot. So if you could um, kindly turn on your cameras and give us your biggest smile, Epeli will, uh, Epeli from Pina will be uh, letting us know when, uh, when he's ready to take the shot. So um, yes, if I can have everyone please turn on their cameras, um, Epeli, and when you're ready. I'm just gonna wait for everyone to turn on their camera. Ready, three, two, one. And then the next okay? one, uh, oh. just another one. Oops. Sorry, already. Ready. Uh, 
Yeah. Ready. Last one. Three, two, one. Hold on, let me do that again. Ready, three, two, three, two, one. So thank you. Thank you, Billy. I was holding my breath. I thought I was gonna like knock out. Um, we have one more question from Sarah. Sarah uh, Sefeti. Sarah is a final year journalism student and she has uh, she also writes for Ireland's business her question is um, and this I think is targeted at Catherine and Angus um, is there a similar spatial yeah. planning for Fiji as it was for Tonga can you elaborate uh, or if there are other plans uh, if there are plans to extend that to other Pacific mm -hmm. Island countries Yes. Um, yes. So in Fiji, we just started a partnership mm -hmm. with the government of Fiji to support mm -hmm. a Blue Prosperity Program that includes marine spatial planning, blue economy support, and uh, support on sustainable fisheries. So we actually signed an MOU in November. I think it was, or no, maybe early December of, um, of 2021. And we've been working with the government and with um, some of the key organizations in are in uh, Fiji to really develop a work plan. So that's it's really important for us when we support these kinds of processes to to understand where and how we can best support that work. That said, I will say that uh, Fiji is um, has has done quite a bit of work already in this space, um, especially in partnership with IUCN Oceania. And I don't know if anybody from uh, that team is on the call, uh, but th there's been efforts uh, for the past uh, few years, and there is already a what they call a zero draft marine spatial plan for the offshore area that has undergone mm -hmm. some consultation. Um, so the the quick next steps are going to be yeah. to conduct a, another round of consultation on that plan. Um, but we're also looking at the near shore or the inshore environment and to uh, work with a Fiji and the communities to understand how we can support that nearshore spatial planning process. Um, in addition to Tonga, I think as some people noted, we have partnerships in the Federated States of Micronesia, as well as in Samoa. Um, and there are some other marine spatial planning efforts that are underway in the Pacific, um, for instance, in Vanuatu and in the Solomon mm -hmm. Islands, uh, once again, I mm -hmm. and Oceania has been engaged in um, in the processes there. So, uh, I think there's a lot of really exciting work, and and quite honestly, the the Pacific is globally leading in um, in marine spatial planning and using marine spatial planning as a tool to create uh, comprehensive systems of uh, marine spatial planning or, or marine protection. Um, as well as ocean use. Thanks. Um, thank you, Catherine. That was, um, I, I'm sure that was uh, good enough for uh, Sarah. Sarah, I hope that was a uh, fair game for you. Um, if not, I have uh, put it in the chat that all the presentations and contacts of the speakers will be available. So you're more than welcome to uh, contact them and interview them um, after these sessions. We um, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for all the speakers. Um, we are almost toward the end of our, um, our first session. And uh, our last, well, our second last session is with uh, two people from the region. We have um, Stanley Simpson, who is the, um, uh, the director of MyTV uh, based in Fiji. He's also the director of media production house, Business Media. Um, Stanley has over 20 years of experience in Fiji and the region's media. He's been writing like like Marisani. He's been writing about everything from, and I guess this is this rings true for a lot of uh, Pacific Island media. You uh, you don't specialize in a field. You you write about trade, about the environment, about women's rights issues. Um, you know you tell stories from the field, uh, whether it has to do with um, with fishing or with uh, um, 
relocation uh, as he did for EJN. He was one of our previous grantees writing about uh, the plight of the people in Narikoso, Kandavu, uh, an island in Fiji. So welcome, Stanley. Um, it's lovely to have you with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to pass the floor on to you now so you can uh, tell us a little bit about the challenges you face uh, writing about um, the stories in, in the region. Oh, I see Stanley is having a few issues. I'm, um, I'm also told that Ofani is sick today. So our second speaker in this session is unable to join us. He has the flu and he, um, and he, he can't, can barely get out of bed. Um, but in the meantime, if you could just give me a minute, I'm just going to uh, try and get hold of Stanley who was trying to, to log in. Um, he, Stanley is, um, he's just asked for two minutes. Uh, he has an emergency and he's at the same time trying to log into this session to present. Uh, my colleague Imelda, who's based in the Philippines, has been um, posting a couple of uh, links to, to our work as well as uh, our story grants, which will be available following uh, the workshop. It's actually open now till the end of April. Um, there's a link that she has shared. So in the meantime, I'd like to um, uh, remind you that, um, you know, there, there are 12 story grants available. Um, and uh, Catherine posted a couple of questions, some ideas that you can think about. Uh, but also Marisani, um, you know, was talking about the need to write stories from the region. So, um, you know, if there's something that you feel passionate about that relates to the oceans, whether it's on ocean waste management, on ocean acidification, uh, climate change uh, related issues, um, that would be great for us to hear from you. There's a um, link that Imelda has just posted in the chat. You know, you can have a look at it uh, while we wait for Stanley to, to join us and talk a little bit about uh, the challenges he's faced writing about uh, environmental and oceans issues. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, Marisani has also uh, mentioned that there are two upcoming oceans um, conferences, one of which is in Palau next month, that's uh, around uh, mid-April. And that's the Our Oceans Conference. And then, of course, we have the um, UN uh, uh, Conference later on in the year, which is in June. Uh, there's a possibility of supporting a number of journalists from the region to attend both uh, conferences, the one in Palau and the one in Lisbon later in the year. So, you know, we, we are looking to your stories. We are uh, watching what you write. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're holding uh, these sessions is so that you have a little bit more understanding on, on some of the issues that the region is facing, but, but also, you know, and as Marisani has said, uh, we're, we're in the Pacific, we are, we have more ocean than land mass. So, you know, it's, it's only, um, it's only right that you write about what's happening here. It doesn't have to be a news story. It can be from, um, you know, uh, a human interest angle. There's lots of people, um, that can, you know, talk about the, the issues that they're facing. Um, and, and I must remind you as well that um, this is only the first of three sessions. So our next session is on Thursday, same time, 1 p.m. PG time to 3.30. Um, and then our last session is on Monday next week, April 4th. And it's at the same time from 1 p.m. PG time to, to 3.30. Uh, but also if you attend all three sessions, then you have, um, uh, US $30 stipend to cover for your Wi-Fi costs. So, you know, everyone that attends the three sessions uh, will be getting a stipend to, to cover their Wi-Fi costs. Um, so, yeah, let me just uh, ping Stanley while uh, you maybe access the, 
the um, story grant site and, and take a look, but also, um, you know, start thinking about uh, some of the stories you might uh, want to cover. And um, we, we will be looking out for, for your proposals. Um, while we're waiting for Stanley, I might just, um, you know, hand the floor to my colleague Imelda because she has been posting quite a bit uh, and she may want to tell you, um, you know, she, she's also been to the Pacific. Uh, she's conducted a couple of uh, mobile journalism workshops uh, as well as environment, environmental reporting workshops in the region. Uh, so she, she um, you know, she can tell you some of the challenges uh, she has discussed. Uh, in these spaces, Imelda, uh, while we're waiting for Stanley. Um, thanks, thanks, Donna, for that. Um, um, yeah, uh, so uh, I just would like to remind everyone to uh, apply for the Pacific Islands Story Grants. Um, this is a call for um, journalists to pitch uh, in-depth uh, or investigative stories on um, uh, environmental and climate change issues in the Pacific, especially on um, oceans uh, as well. Uh, and uh, Donna, just uh, I just would like to just uh, uh, focus on uh, the story grants uh, and the theme that we are considering, like how and why um, is ocean health important in the fight against um, climate change and what environmental policies or um, strategies are in place uh, to protect and um, manage uh, the oceans and coastal, uh, coastal regions of the Pacific Islands as well. And uh, what strategies could be adapted. And um, another theme that we are uh, considering is um, the women. How are women and uh, of course other uh, vulnerable groups impacted by uh, climate change and uh, the oceans in the region. So specifically this is more about um, the oceans in the Pacific. So I hope uh, you can uh, check the link and uh, apply for the grant. So we're giving uh, 12 uh, grants for, for Pacific Islands um, journalists. Um, and yeah, uh, as my colleagues uh, have mentioned in the chat as well, that um, uh, you're welcome to register with uh, the EJN um, uh, or Earth Journalism Network uh, website uh, as a member of the EGN. And I think I shared the link a while ago because um, um, there are really many opportunities uh, uh, available for you, um, not just uh, at this time, but at the duration of the year. And you had applied for um, story guns, not just for um, the oceans, uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity, and other fellowships as well, and conferences that we can attend this year, like um, the COP27 climate change uh, uh, in Egypt. Yeah, I think that's it for me, Donna, unless um, you have anything to add. Um, no, I think uh, you, you've said everything that I wanted to say as well, or given them a reminder. Um, and, you know, uh, James, our executive director for EJN, has put in the chat that, that there are other grant opportunities as well as um, other workshop um, opportunities uh, available. If you go on to the EJN uh, website, you will see that um, there, you know, there's there's many opportunities available. It's not just uh, on oceans reporting, uh, not just on climate change. Um, so, you know, we we welcome you to uh, to join and to to visit our website uh, for more information. Um, while we're waiting for for Stanley to join us, um, perhaps my colleague at the Weight Institute, Shana, may want to. Um, raise a couple of, um, you know, tips or issues. Uh, Shana, did you want to add anything? 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking to you at the third session as well, but I am really excited to see everyone on this call and to echo some of the opportunities. Um, there's actually a lot of opportunity at the upcoming Our Oceans Conference. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the week, but there is opportunity to apply to be a blogger, even if you're not able to attend in person to cover the event, uh, get exclusive access to video and interviews. And I will actually be attending and I'm happy to help facilitate um, Zoom interviews with people if that's something that you're interested in. So please feel free to get in touch with me if you're interested in covering the Our Ocean Conference. And we'll also be bringing some of the conference organizers um, from the Palau President's Office and from the US State Department later this week. So that will be a really great opportunity in our third session to hear exactly what to expect from the conference, how to cover it, how to get interviews and things like that. So feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm the communications director at the Weight Institute. So you can always see me as a resource if you're looking for a subject matter expert when it comes to the ocean. If we don't know the answer, we will hopefully know the right person to connect you to. So really see us as a first stop of places to reach out to if you're chasing a story and want to look something up um, but yeah, really excited for this week. I really appreciate all of you being here and can't wait to work with you more. Thanks, Shana. Um, Stanley is now online, so I'm going to reintroduce him so he can start the session for us. As I mentioned, he's the director of MyTV. He's had over 20 years of experience. Stanley um, has also been an EJN grantee. So, um, you know, he, he's, he understands um, uh, the challenges. He's, you know, interviewed so many people on the ground when he um, wrote the story on um, on people at Narikoso having to to move because they were uh, facing sea level rise uh, issues and, and you know the impact of climate change. Uh, welcome, Stanley. It's lovely to have you join us. Uh, sorry that you had connection issues, but um, we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the challenges uh, you faced uh, reporting on uh, oceans issues, but also uh, general environmental reporting for you in the Pacific. Hello, Stanley, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, my apologies for coming in late. Uh, quite a few things I was, I've, uh, I'm, I'm going through the moment. I can't stay for long. I can speak for 10, 15 minutes. I understand Ofani um, is not uh, available, but uh, I think it's a very important topic to, to, uh, to people to, to, to discuss and, and, uh, and, and move forward on. Because one thing I will say uh, about uh, oceans reporting in the Pacific, my view is that it is not being taken seriously or not being taken seriously enough. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, gap, a big gap that um, just existed for a long time. Uh, it's almost that we, um, it almost like we need other, we always wait for other people to come and tell us about the issues to do with the oceans in the Pacific rather than us raising it ourselves. And it's a big neglected portion, uh, big neglected aspect of, uh, of reporting in, in Fiji you know, and in the region, I believe, that uh, we only seem to be covering what other people are saying about our oceans. Or if Greenpeace say something, or you know, if, if another organization or international body says something about our ocean, rather than what uh, than what we are doing or what needs to be done uh, from by our country to uh, for our oceans uh, itself, we uh, we should be world leaders in ocean reporting, and uh, sadly, um, that's not uh, that's not. That's not been the case. Sorry, I've, I'm having connection issues, so I've just off the video, my video for a while. Uh, so, 
I think one of the one of the key challenges is that we're one, as I said, we're not taking it seriously. We're not doing it in a comprehensive way. And this is something that uh, I feel needs to be addressed. Uh, one, uh, is, uh, I'm very thankful to EJN for you know trying to instigate something in this area. And it's something that uh, I know in the Fijian Media Association, this is one topic. Uh, you know, we've always discussed climate change, but in terms of oceans, it's something that we feel we need to uh, to get more, I guess, some of our senior people involved. And it's not covered just as uh, just as when somebody puts out a report on uh, on the issue or when there's, a, a, you know, just an announcement to be made and then we are covering the, the report because our people are dealing with the oceans every day. And... Unfortunately, the world, the, we are not really, uh, I don't, we're not adequately covering these voices that all the people do that. We're not covering the women who are going to the reefs uh, every day, the issues that they face, the, the men, the issues with the, uh, you know, resource issues. Uh, I, for instance, have always thought of doing something about the situation in my own uh, place in um, in South Savu, from where I'm from. Uh, and I've never got to it, but, and then uh, I think about it, this is an ocean issue that's existed since I was a young person. And, uh, you know, I'm the first one to admit that uh, as a senior journalist, someone who's, you know, uh, relatively well known and, uh, and that's quite senior in the industry. I haven't even read, written about ocean issues in my own hometown. And uh, that's uh, when I was just thinking quickly about uh, an issue to raise today. It's about how we need to take these issues that we ourselves are facing much more serious rather than writing about the international, uh, you know, all this, all this uh, just when somebody put out a report. Uh, and then when I look back at my career, at what ocean reporting I've done, it's uh, it's very few. You know, I've, we've covered politics, we cover all kinds of issues, but the, the thing that we basically rely on, oceans, we don't seem to put much uh, much emphasis uh, much emphasis on it. So uh, we need to, I think, uh, relook at. Uh, some of these, uh, the way we're reporting and the way we're approaching ocean reporting and um, I mean, realign our perspective, change our perspective, change our mindset. I think it's a mindset thing uh, and I'm speaking here from a, a personal view and basically what I've observed. You know, I come from uh, an island uh, where, you know, I grew up basically in the ocean and uh, I've seen, you know, the places where my grandmother and I would go and get our, um, uh, you know, get an octopus and where I swim, where I see fish and uh, and all the things that we survived when we were small. I can, I go there now and it's dead coral. And uh, we look at it and we say, oh, coral, you know, but we never ever write about things. So I've never, you never even go and I've, I realize I've never even gone interviewed the people who I grew up with and other people who are still living there and ask them, how are you surviving now? What's the impact of, of the damage to that reef, uh, to your livelihoods now? So the, I mean, as I said, uh, one first key issue that I think that we should uh, first all admit uh, in the Pacific, uh, or like can speak for Fiji, is that we haven't taken oceans reporting seriously. Maybe some of the editors may not agree with me, they may say, uh, maybe I can speak for myself, but I know I think I've, I've been around to be able to say, I don't think generally we've covered it well enough or thoroughly enough because we're supposed to be world leaders. It's something, it's, it's like Pacific studies. We live in the Pacific and, uh, you know, we have people like in universities like ANU and University of Hawaii and University of Wellington writing more about the Pacific than all of than us in the Pacific. And this is the same thing to do with the oceans that we need to become the world leaders in writing about our issues and telling these stories of people say like my hometown in South Savu, who, you know, there's a, there's a joke that's being said now in my, in my, uh, in my village that uh, in one day on the reef, 
a rock gets turned over five times by five different uh, ladies, by five different women or five different men looking for something to eat. So one person comes, turns the rock to look for a she shell or look for a check even octopus. An hour later, someone comes and turns the rock over again and the rock gets turned over five times and it just leads to further you know, damage. And, and I'm thinking of that. I mean, that's a story um, of the ocean and just how the city changed and, the, and where our people are going further and further out to, to, get, to get food for their livelihood. I mean, we have, uh, then we have the issues of how people are actually not eating the food that they uh, catch, the, live, the fresh ocean uh, things that they catch, but are selling it to the middlemen and uh, then buying uh, tin fish. You know, this is a story we've heard about, but how, or how uh, you know, can we really write about this and prove this to show that this is really happening and, uh, and why it is happening uh, and tie it in with the other topics. So there is this angle that I think that we uh, can, uh, if there's something that we can look at trying to change uh, this year, it is uh, about how we put the importance of our own experiences into the ocean stories and not just writing about ocean stories when it's given from an international perspective. I think the other issue, the challenges have been faced and I faced this and uh, I think one of the key advantages, uh, the key opportunity provided by these EGN projects is providing resources and particularly money with supporting uh, ocean reporting because it needs resources and it needs money for us to cover, you know, to write about uh, ocean issues, uh, to go to the islands because this is where the real stories are. Um, the ones in the islands. Well, for instance, the story I did on climate change from Narikos in Kandavu, uh, it's not easy place to go to. It's not an easy place to reach. But if you go there, you'll get some of the best stories in the world. If we just take the initiative to write the proposal uh, and to make contact with the people um, and and hear their stories. And I think we bring a very fresh perspective to the table with what experiences that our people are going through uh, in terms of the ocean. Here in Suva, for instance, we have um, saving the Suva Haba campaign. And I haven't really seen, you know, from personal experiences, these are people trying to, to save the harbor, trying to, to create awareness of the harbor. There's so many things that can be done in the harbor in terms of recreation, in terms of the fishing, in terms of keeping it clean. And uh, in Fiji, I don't think we're covering this enough. They were devoting a lot of uh, time uh, on these issues. So I think one key aspect when, uh, when I talk about oceans reporting now, uh, discussing with fellow editors, discussing with journalists is how seriously we need to take uh, these issues, how we need to change our perspective and the resources and time we need to put in it. As I said, we should be world leaders in oceans reporting. There's so many issues that's happening, uh, foreign vessels. I mean, it's, it should be in many ways, uh, there should be business reporting, uh, you know, feature articles and things, and and there should be special dedicated coverage on the oceans because this is one of our major assets or one of our major resources in the Pacific. And I think uh, uh, one thing that uh, that I I know and. Um, and you know, it's just I don't know whether we've just been uh, just we've been diverted or distracted, or we've we have other priorities, or maybe we are we are busy with following you know other issues, politics. We haven't really coordinated well with the groups in the region, in Fiji and the region, who are doing great work on the oceans. And uh, I think that's a it's a failure both from the media. Uh, I, I think it's a failure everywhere. Uh, and I'll be the first to admit it, you know, that I think we haven't connected enough. Uh, we haven't treated each other, uh, treated, uh, uh, you know, like we haven't really engaged in a sustained way. I think we're doing one-offs 
and that's not good enough. I think we really need to be more sustained and engaging in how we cover uh, cover these oceans because I think a lot of things being done and uh, sadly, uh, sometimes it gets the attention it deserves when an overseas journalist arrives in the country and writes about it. And I just, uh, you know, sometimes sit in and, and then I see something done by one of the uh, IUCN, they did a briefing recently, I, you know, WWF or, or some of these groups, they do amazing stuff uh, and then they do a campaign and we cover the campaign, but um, I don't think it's broad or sustained uh, uh, enough where we are waiting for them to do something, we're not doing it ourselves and sometimes they're waiting for us and uh, not, not engaging themselves, but I think that we can collaborate much more effectively going forward. So I think in many ways going forward uh, from the media and the people who work on the oceans, I think we can reflect on this. There has been some, uh, there have been some good stuff done, I know, but uh, it's few and far between. And I think we can be more engaging. As I said, uh, I keep believing and I keep saying this over and over again, why haven't we become the world leaders in ocean reporting that we should be uh, in terms of the Pacific and the issues that's being faced? Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we are always waiting for something international to happen. And then we are writing, you know, like, okay, they initiate and they give us the theme for the ocean. Then we try and cover and write to the agenda that way. When I think there's also we can look at ways where we need to initiate some of these stories, some of these campaigns ourselves. I think we can, we can collaborate with media, with other media. We can collaborate with media from other countries in the region and, uh, and, and put out, you know, profiling uh, or putting out big major stories uh, on one ocean issue that needs, you know, that needs urgent attention. So uh, there is, uh, my, you know, my, mm, my um, my contribution to this uh, today in terms of challenges is basically if we can, uh, the main thing, if we can take this a bit more seriously, uh, and I'm the first one to admit that I'll need to do that myself. And secondly, that we reflect on it. And, and I think if we can put together some kind of sustained uh, plan of how we can, uh, how we can keep, keep this in focus and not then it just turns up uh, and uh, becomes a fashionable uh, item on the international agenda, on the regional agenda. And then, we, and then we write about it. It's something that affects our people every day. We are a maritime country. I've often, uh, you know, even wanted for a basic thing, you know, we don't have much uh, fishing, uh, fishing, fishing and diving magazines. I, I've mentioned this to some of the journalists that uh, we have the best dive spots in the world. We have uh, the best, um, you know, fishing. And uh, we don't have fishing magazines. We don't have fishing sections. We don't have dive sections. I mean, I've just read, I saw an article written about my, my hometown. Um, it's, uh, I can share the link. The, the story was uh, where to go to find Nemo. And um, this, it's, I think, Travel Asia, Asia, something like that was the, the writer's writing from. And she was uh, talking about, she went to my hometown in, in South Savu, and she, was, she went to the dive spot, which is called Namena. And she wrote there, and in fact, I, uh, I'd like to read this because, and I'll end it with this, because it just tells me how we, we really get people from the rest of the world to come and write about us and talk about how beautiful and amazing the ocean is, and we don't even write about it because I was kind of embarrassed, but I just want to let you just get this link. Uh, please give me a moment. So the article is, this is where you need to go. It's travel leisure. This is where you need to go in Fiji to find Nemo. And she's talking about the place where my uncles and all my relatives and friends and everybody I know in a hotel are working, are working, working there. So, you know, another thing which I take for granted. And it's a place that's uh, 10 minutes 
from where I go fishing. And she writes, uh, uh, hold on. She says, there are, um, known as the soft coral capital of the world, the reefs surrounding South Savu are part of the coral triangle, a fringing reef formed by volcanoes and home to the greatest biodiversity of marine life on the planet. And there I was, I'm from there and I don't write it like this. So, and then she's like, there are a number of underwater fields, many of them just two minute boat ride from the resort's pier. But perhaps the greatest is Namana Reserve, a protected barrier reef about an hour's boat ride from the resort. I have snorkeled in some of the most incredible places, including the Great Barrier Reef and Indonesia's Raja Ampat. So I'm hard to impress, but I almost choked on my snorkel. So blown away I was by the sheer scale and vibrancy of the coral at Namena. It's so inspiring that Pixar artists dived here before drawing the animation for Finding Nemo, making Jean-Michel Cousteau Resort their base. I mean, this is someone writing about us and we're not even, you know, I don't know how many journalists in Fiji have ever, uh, including me, who's from there, have written about it. So in, in many ways, we have uh, we need a lot of uh, changing of perspective in how we uh, how we uh, look at oceans reporting and addressing the challenge. And it shouldn't be a challenge. We really just need to change our mindset and get on to it. So uh, that's what I'll end my my short presentation and I'm sorry I'm uh, running doing three or four different things at once but um, as Donna understands I normally do but uh, I really think that this is an important area that we all need to um, need to engage on thank you thank you Stanley um before you run away do we have any one or two burning questions from the floor that anyone would like to ask him before he leaves If not, I think we can all agree that there are a lot of stories to tell. We are a maritime state, as he says. Uh, we are large ocean states. We have a lot of stories to tell from the ground up. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's up to us if we want to cover these stories or not. Otherwise, you have people uh, coming in from elsewhere writing about um, our ocean, writing about the Pacific. And, and you know the issues that that we face here. So, if there are no stories, um, story, sorry. If there no, there is a, a question. We have a question from Sia and Tonga Stanley. Uh, there have been many challenges highlighted from a media organization standpoint. Is it due mostly to public interest, lack of resources, or uh, I seem to not see the end of that question, but. Uh, Danny, can you see the question uh, from Sia in the chat? Okay, so she's asking, what are the challenges mostly attributed to? I think, uh, you know, I agree, you know, you, know, you know, in fact, the best ocean stories then I read about sometimes like the in-flight magazines that's, you know, we're writing for tourists. Um, and maybe that's because, uh, who knows, you know, maybe we've been, uh, you know, we, it's all been about promotion and um, and not much about sustain. You know, we're not really talking about how looking at it as livelihoods, perhaps. Um, I think the stories that get a lot of coverage is... Uh, you know, or, or attention of those that we write, uh, you know, maybe to, to promote, because I mean, we took the ocean and I said, look, the, 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 the report I just cited, you know, is to do with the resort, you know, so that's mainly where a lot, where a lot of our ocean, um, ocean reporting has been geared towards in terms of attracting people to come to the country and, you know, and, 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 and it's about the business. And of course, that's, that's uh, that's uh, that's an important part, uh, and that's, but I think we need to make it. Um, we all we need to also make it uh, an industry where it's written for our people, um, and written from a range of. Uh, so it's not just about attracting people about how beautiful we are. 
uh, you know, we need to talk really delve more into the issues surrounding the oceans and what needs to be done to keep it that way, to protect it, and how a vast majority of our of our people uh, need need that ocean to survive uh, or survive on the income from that ocean. So I think it's resolved, but I look, I think it's mindset. I just think we haven't taken it seriously. I think we've taken a lot of this for granted. And I, I think it's just a change of mindset that we need to, uh, we need to, to, uh, to take a bit more seriously and, uh, and look, and uh, look at moving forward on. Okay, we have quite a few questions, Stanley. I'm not sure if you can see the chat, uh, but a lot of, you know, uh, basically, can you give us an example of how we can connect uh, a story, you know, that focuses on the oceans? How, uh, just, just an example of something that you would do um, as a story. How can we connect these oceans issues to, to everyday life? You know, maybe from a human interest angle, obviously, but, um, if, if you can share with us uh, something that you would do, um, you know, something that you would look at and how you would, how you would write that story, who would you talk to, uh, what stats would you look at, who would you interview? Can you quickly just give us a, a wrap up of that uh, before you leave? Well, I, always, I mean, um, I think all the journalists here are aware of, you know, you have to put, uh, put, uh, put a face. To the story, put the human interest uh, first, and uh, I've always felt that uh, our people are great stories. You know, the uh, in especially in the village. If you look at somebody, when I went and did the story on Narikos, I was amazed at the different kind of people. That uh, usually someone who's in a village, uh, there's going to be people who've been in the village all their life, but there's someone who's been through so much in life that they end up again in their village in a far away, you know, so, sort of in a rural or remote place. And, uh, and if you look at COVID, the stories of COVID-19 resilience, for instance, a lot of where people returned to was the ocean, uh, to the land and to the ocean to survive. And uh, I, uh, I would look at... Uh, Look at it from that angle. If you write, I mean, there's so many things. Uh, looking at the survival, um, looking at it, uh, how someone's uh, it, it, always all these, these issues we do with ocean and things. I would look at how they're connecting with. You can connect with so many other issues with NCDs, with uh, tourism, with um, agriculture. You can with uh, self-sustainable with small business with women's empowerment, there's so many angles that uh, you can look to tie in into one story uh, that are intertwined. And that's the story really of the ocean. Now, uh, to me, the ocean as I know it, you know, and I think we need to try and look back is about those grandmothers. Uh, maybe there's few and far between who still are going out to the reef every day. They've been doing it for eight years, but how many times have their stories been told? You know, it's almost like we take them for granted and how many more hours and how many more rocks do they have to look under or put there to try and get something to feed their, to feed their family. Uh, even in Suva here, we having, you know, this, I don't see much now, but you know, there's when I, uh, in school before you come past, there'd be women in the seawall throwing the line out. Uh, we know one of the famous short stories we study in school is about the women who who's, uh, you know, just fishing in the sea while trying to feed her grandchildren. So, you know, if we can return to some of these stories, we start to tell people, oh, there's people still surviving on these stories out there. You know, we don't have to be going, talking about the resort. You know, we, of course, they're very important, but always we seem to be talking about people who are at the high end of the, of the scale, so to speak. Eh? If we can bring it relevant by talking that there are still people who every day or every second day have to go out to the, you know, cover their faces, put ash on their faces, cover their face, things, and out in the hot sun in the reef, walking for three hours, picking things from the reef. So, you know, that's, you know, those are some of the things I would be looking at. Thanks, Stanley. I think that we uh, are now 
have come to the end of this first session. Um, thank you very much, Danny. Um, that was a very interesting session with you talking about the importance of writing our stories uh, because we're from the Pacific, uh, but also giving us a couple of examples of what we can link it to. And, you know, as you rightly said, there's so many things that you can link um, ocean stories to, you can link it to trade, um, to tourism, to climate change. Uh, so, so thank you for that. I hope that's given us a lot of uh, food for thought uh, before our next session, which is on Thursday. Don't forget, it's at 1 p.m. Uh, Thursday, Fiji time. Um, and we, we just want to thank everybody that has joined us. You, uh, for those of you who have been here throughout the sessions, if you are with us for all three sessions, you will get a stipend to cover your Wi-Fi expenses. It's not a lot, but it is something that, um, you know, that will cover your Wi-Fi expenses. So once again, uh, thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, we really appreciate your time as well as all the participants. I note that Bernadette from Palau is here as well, and she has written a lot about the ocean as well as the environment. We still have two more sessions to go. She has, uh, she will be called upon to also uh, speak. So Bernadette, that's a uh, heads up. Um, and once again, thank you everybody. Have a good uh, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. I'll see you on Thursday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Donna. Bye, everyone. See you next session. Thank you. Bye-bye.